So I would like to introduce the third panel of the day on food labeling. And we have uh, Professor Nicole Nicoletti, mm -hmm. who is Assistant Professor of Law at Valparaiso University in Indiana. She teaches torts, food law and policy, pretrial litigation drafting, and legal writing and reasoning. Her research interests include food law and policy, judicial decision making, law and cognitive science, and legal ethics. Uh, she's published a number of articles on natural foods and labeling options for those. Uh, we also have Bill Fries, who is a science policy analyst for the Center for Food Safety. He joined the Center for Food Safety in 2006 as a science policy analyst. And in his six years with the Safer Food, Safer Farms campaign at Friends of the Earth, he authored numerous reports and comments to government agencies concerning the science and regulation of genetically engineered crops. More recent work involves assessments of the failed promise of GE crops, industrial biotechnology, and cost-effective alternatives to genetic engineering. We also have Adam Levitt, who is a partner at Grant and Eisenhofer in Chicago, Illinois, where he chairs that firm's consumer practice group. He specializes in complex commercial litigation and class action litigation in the areas of consumer protection, antitrust, securities, technology, and agricultural law. He has recovered more than $1 billion in damages for his clients and class members, and presently serves in leadership roles in numerous class and other complex litigations. Uh, before I turn the panel over to our speakers, I'd like to make a few remarks of my own about food. And as we all know, Americans have a complicated, strange relationship with food. We eat too much, uh, sometimes we eat too little. We eat the wrong things and we ruin our health. Unlike tobacco, alcohol, and other things we might ingest, we can't get along without food, but try as we might, we don't seem to be eating the right things. And the evidence is contradictory about our food habits. We're gaining weight as a population as we eat more processed foods laden with fat, sugar, and salt. There's a recent report from the Center for Science and the Public Interest that reveals that our obesity rate has doubled between 1970 and 2010, and that's probably no surprise to anyone. That report suggests that our consumption of high-fat meat and calorie-rich grains has also risen, but that our fish eating, which is arguably or debatably a healthier alternative, has remained flat. At the same time, uh, some Americans are uh, expressing a growing interest in natural, organic foods. We're a nation of meat eaters, but some people have begun to consume a vegan or vegetarian diet. We have also become more interested in sustainable foods and ethically sourced or humanely raised foods. Science is sometimes viewed as a friend in this arena and sometimes as an enemy in our efforts to feed the growing human population in a healthy, ethical way. Science has allowed us to genetically modify organisms to make them more resistant to insects, drought, and pesticides, but some question the wisdom of genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered organisms. The pro-GMO, anti-GMO issue has become extremely polarized, with each side accusing the other of fraud, deception, greed, and ignorance, among other things. Although GMOs are largely plant foods, many of those foods are fed to the animals that we eat. Some studies, shows, some studies show that cows fed genetically modified growth hormone to increase milk production, suffer a much greater rate of illness and death, and that pigs fed a diet of genetically modified corn and soy had higher rates of intestinal problems. Other studies suggest that GM foods are perfectly safe and can be beneficial, for example, by having a higher nutrient content. Expanding the scope of GMOs, genetically modified animals are coming on the scene and are appearing in wider variations as scientists experiments with, experiment with making animals hardier and larger. Today's panel on food labeling will examine public dissemination of information to the public about the food that we eat, does the law require food producers to convey the information that the public wants and needs to know about what we consume? Could labels be clearer, more comprehensive? 
Are there reasons not to give out certain information about foodstuffs? And will better labeling give us the information we need to make better choices about foods? So without uh, further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. talking about the understandably uh, confusing claims that are being made on products um, that have to do with animal welfare. And it's important, consumer surveys show, for those meat eaters to consume products that are sustainably raised. There was a survey conducted by the Animal Welfare Approved and a university uh, in East, Carol the East Carolina University about these claims that are made on meat products. And 91% of the respondents said that it's important to them to have a product that is sustainable. And what that means for those consumers is that the animals are treated with a high standard of welfare, that they're allowed access to pasture, that they're allowed access to clean water, um, they're not raised with antibiotics and with both hormones. But although consumers, 91% of them, said that it's important that these meat products make these claims, only half of them have any confidence in what the labels actually mean. So I'll be discussing today a, a variety of claims that are made on meat products and try to decode what their meanings are. So the first claim, uh, humane and high welfare, what does this mean? Well, there is no legal standard or regulation defining this. So for many consumers, it's very confusing because the image that a consumer might have in their mind is something like this, where the animals are treated in um, an idyllic setting, um, allowed to uh, you know, be at pasture, um, but this is often not true for meat products that contain this claim. Uh, however, there are third-party certifications that have set pretty high standards for what the claim means. So although it's not regulated, consumers can look to these third-party certifications for specific standards. So Animal Welfare Approved has a set of standards, and those standards include um, requiring the animal to be raised on pasture. It's the only label that requires that all animals have access to pasture. It awards approval only to family farmers. So um, feedlot farmers cannot have an animal welfare approved uh, label on their products. They don't charge any fees to the participating farmers and they claim to do this so that they can remain independent um, and avoid conflicts of interest. Uh, it, it incorporates the most comprehensive standards for high welfare farming or so they claim. There's another label, uh, Certified Humane, Raised and Handled, and they claim to meet the humane farm animal care standards, which includes nutritious diet without antibiotics or hormones, the animals are raised with shelter, resting areas, sufficient space, and the ability to engage in natural behaviors. So animals are allowed um, to either to flap their wings, to move around, to socialize, uh, things like that. Um, and this is also third-party accredited. So the Certified Humane Association sets the standards, but then they have third parties to certify it to make sure that the meat producers do meet the standards that they set forth. Um, they claim to be the gold standard for the animal welfare. Uh, here's some more information about exactly what the label means. So animals have ample space, shelter, and gentle handling to limit their stress. They have ample fresh water and a healthy diet of quality feed without antibiotics or hormones. Cages, crates, and tie stalls are forbidden, and animals must be free to do what comes naturally. Chickens can flap their wings and dust bathe. Pigs have space to move around the route. Producers must comply with food safety and environmental regulations and the American Meat Institute standards, which are higher standards than the Federal Humane Slaughter Act. There is another label, the American Humane Certified, and they claim to provide a verifiable assurance that products containing the American Humane Certified label have met rigorous science-based welfare standards and were humanely raised 
throughout their life process. Um, but there has been some criticism because although this label claims to treat animals in a humane way, it allows cages for production of chickens and there's no pasture requirements. So again, that could be misleading to a consumer who may have uh, an image in their head of the animals being able to be at pasture, engage in natural behaviors, um, when that's not necessarily part of their standard. The Food Alliance, that's yet another certification that can be found on meat products. It's a nonprofit organization that certifies the farms, ranches, and food processors and distributors for sustainable agricultural and facility management practices. By choosing Food Alliance certified products, consumers and commercial food buyers support safe and fair working conditions, humane treatment of animals, and good environmental stewardship. So they set the standards, but they also certify. So they don't have an independent third party certifying um, that the meat producers meet their standards. So they are more concerned with um, environmental standards, but they also provide, they also require that there are no GMOs and no cloned animals um, that will meet their standards. Um, but they are also, like the other certifications that I just spoke about, are concerned with providing a natural environment to the animals, making sure that they uh, have enough space and can engage in natural behaviors. Um, the Global Animal Alliance, that's yet another one. The partnership brings together farmer scientists, ranchers, retailers, and animal advocates with the common goal of wanting to improve the welfare of animals in agriculture. So what does that mean for that organization? Um, as you've heard about, they set forth certain steps that producers can meet from very basic, fundamental, not strict standard of having no crates, no cages, no crowding, that's step one. Um, arguably getting more strict and more humane, if you will, as you move along. And so the first step, no crates, no cages, no crowding. Step two, in an enriched environment, um, which allows for a bale of straw for chickens to hide behind and climb on, bowling ball for pigs to manipulate and shove around, or a few sturdy objects for cattle to rub against when they need a good scratch. So basically allowing animals to engage in their natural behaviors. Um, step three, enhanced outdoor access. Pigs and chickens still live in buildings, but they have access to outdoor areas. Step four, pasture-centered. Uh, step five, animal-centered, all physical alterations prohibited. So no nose rings, clippings, snippings, or branding. Uh, um, no bee cutting uh, also. Um, <coughs> and we get on to step five, the animal centered entire life on the same farm so that they can um, be traced <coughs> and live on the same farm. They can't, and it can only be transported for very short distances. Um, so there are different um, certificates that are administered for meat producers that achieve each of these steps. Whole Foods Market, they offer products that meet these five-step animal welfare ratings. So here's a chart that compares the different labels that claim to be um, animal welfare standards uh, for egg-laying hens. And it compares whether these standards allow for wire cages, are they prohibited, the amount of space that each hen may have, uh, access to outdoor space, is that required, exposure to daylight, purchase and dust bathing required, deep beaking, is that prohibited, destruction of male chicks prohibited. So it can be very, very confusing for consumers because there are all these labels that claim to be a high welfare standard, but as you can see, for example, wire cages, are they prohibited? By most of them they are, but for the United Egg Producers, uh, it's not prohibited. The amount of space that's required for each of the animals, that varies across these labels. Access to outdoor space, you can see half of them don't require outdoor space, while half of them do. Exposure to daylight, um, again, that varies. Uh, so for consumers, it, it really puts the impetus on the consumer to do a lot of research. Um, the bottom line is that the consumer cannot really rely just on that label, have to get behind it to understand what does it really mean, what are these standards, because each one varies significantly. Organic, Bill will talk at length about organic, um, but just a, a couple of things about 
the term. This is strictly regulated by the USDA. The National Organic Program uh, sets very strict regulations. Um, in general, the animal must be raised organically on certified organic pastures. It must be fed certified organic feed for the entire life of the animal. No drugs, antibiotics, or growth hormones must have year-round outdoor access. The animal's organic feed cannot contain animal byproducts, antibiotics, or genetically engineered grains, and cannot be grown using persistent pesticides or chemical fertilizers. However, the label organic, even though consumers do place a lot of trust in it, has been criticized because there are no strict regulations for what does it mean to allow the animal or require the animal to have outdoor access. That has not been defined, and so it varies considerably um, from producer to producer. Natural, this is a term that causes a lot of confusion uh, among consumers. For many consumers, surveys show, they place a higher value on the term natural than they do on organic. But natural is very loosely regulated. There's a definition here from the USDA, the Food Safety and Inspection Service. A natural product is one that contains no artificial ingredients or added color and is only minimally processed, a process which does not fundamentally alter the raw product and is labeled as natural. And on meat products, the label has to explain how the producer is using the term, um, such as the product doesn't have any added colorings or artificial ingredients, it's minimally processed. Um, something to note about natural, although a consumer might think that natural means this is the way that the, the animal has lived its life, the term only relates to the meat product after it has been slaughtered. And I think this is very confusing for consumers. Um, and so it doesn't have to do with the way that the animal was, was brought up or the life that it lived. Because of that confusion, the USDA set forth a standard for naturally raised. So instead of dealing with the meat product after it has been slaughtered, this um, relates to, well, very little of the animal's actual life. So the definition provided by the USDA is that the livestock used for the production of meat and meat products have been raised entirely without growth promoters, antibiotics, except for a couple for parasite control, and have never been fed animal byproducts. So you can see the scope of this definition is very, very limited. It doesn't explain if the animal was raised outdoors or if they were confined in a feedlot. It, it doesn't speak to that at all. So the living conditions not addressed at all in the naturally raised definition. Um, consumers probably have a very, very different conception of what naturally raised means. And there was a, a very good survey conducted by the Consumers Union, and they asked consumers, what do you think this term means? So 86% of consumers thought that the term means that the animal had a diet free of chemicals, drugs, and animal byproducts. That turns out to be true. That's addressed by the definition. However, all of these other items, all these other criteria, not addressed um, by the USDA's definition. So consumers think that the animal naturally raised was raised in a natural environment. Um, so on a pasture, for instance, and not in a feedlot. However, naturally raised, Again, it doesn't address it. So an animal could be in a feedlot under the USDA guidelines. So consumers here are confused. They're being misled by the label. Consumers think that the animal ate a natural diet. Um, that's not necessarily uh, defined by the term because they could be fed GMOs in their feed um, or feed with pesticides in it. Um, Consumers also believe that the animal that is naturally raised was not cloned or genetically engineered. Again, not addressed, so an animal could be uh, cloned and still considered naturally raised by the USDA. Consumers think the animal had access to outdoors, was treated humanely, was not confined. But an animal that was raised in a feedlot um, could be naturally raised by the USDA. So you can see here, this is an example of how consumers are confused and being misled. Here's criticism of the naturally raised standard by the senior scientist at Consumer Union. He stated this regulation will allow an animal that has come from a cloned or genetically engineered stock, was physically altered, raised in confinement without ever seeing the light of day or green of pasture, in poor hygiene conditions with a diet laced with pesticides to be labeled as naturally raised. 
here's a chart that compares organic, what organic means, versus what natural means. So you can see that the standards for organic are much more strict. The farm production practices are inspected by an independent third party for organic. Animals are treated humanely. Um, that's, of course, uh, debatable. All livestock feed is certified organic. The feed is free of animal byproducts. GMOs are prohibited. The feed is produced without toxic pesticides, synthetic fertilizers. Animals are raised without antibiotics or growth hormones. Animals have access to pasture. Animals are finished on family farms, not in feedlots. So that's the criteria for organic. For natural meat, it's, it's up in the air. It's not set forth in any standard. Another term that is confusing, grass-fed. So there is a definition, a very weak one, very weak standard by the USDA, but there's also standards set forth by third-party independent um, accreditors. So the definition from the USDA is that 100% of the diet of grass-fed animals consists of freshly grazed pasture during the growing season and stored grasses, um, hay or grass, during the winter months or drought conditions. So this is a weak standard because the diet, the 100% of, uh, of the grass that can be fed, can have antibiotics or hormones in it. And this does not speak to whether the animal can be allowed access to pasture. They can still be in a feedlot and brought the food. So this could be confusing for consumers who think that grass-fed really means that the animals are allowed to pasture, be at pasture and, and graze as they want to. That, in fact, is not the standard. But there is a more strict standard that's set by the American Grass-Fed Association. It's an, an industry group, but the label is certified by um, an independent third party, and their standards are much more strict. They require that the livestock have access to pasture for the lifetime of the animal. The animals are not permitted to be fed grain or grain by byproducts. The livestock must be on the range, the pasture, and paddocks for their entire lives. The animals cannot be in a feedlot, confined in a pen, um, and they cannot be given hormones or antibiotics. So a consumer who sees grass-fed from the USDA probably has in mind all of these standards. And in fact, the label from the USDA um, does not adhere to these standards at all. Free range, this is another term that's very confusing uh, and consumers have in their mind probably a, a, a scene like this where the animals are allowed access to the outside at, at will and the USDA standards, it's just that producers must demonstrate to the agency that the poultry has been allowed access to the outside. So this definition is limited to poultry. Other animals are not included in this definition at all. Um, and it's a very loose standard. It doesn't say how long they're allowed to be outside um, or how frequently they have to be outside or what conditions. It just, they have to demonstrate some sort of evidence that they have access to the outside. So a very good standard. So this could be considered free range, and most consumers probably would not have this image in their mind when they purchase something and pay a premium for something that is free range. So they could say, well, they have access to outside, you know, we can open, open the windows and allow the air in there. So consumers are understandably misled. Pasture, pasture rates. This is another term that is commonly on meat products. It has no legal significance. It's not regulated at all. So consumers probably think the animals are allowed to be outside as they want to, on a pasture, on the range, when in fact uh, it's really up to the producer to determine what that means for them. Cage free, this is another term that's very confusing. There is no uh, legal definition of the term. It's mostly applied to laying hens, but again, the consumer is going to have an image like this in their mind when they purchase something that's cage-free, um, when really an image like this can be considered cage-free. There are no cages, but uh, crowding is very common. So this just illustrates um, what caged situation would look like cage-free, which is arguably no better, and then 
uh, if it's verified by a third party, something that comes closer at least to um, what the consumer would expect. But I think what this all illustrates is that the burden, unfortunately, is on the consumer. For a consumer who's interested in purchasing new products and who is interested in um, purchasing a product that is of a high animal welfare standard, you really have to do the research to understand what these claims mean. Today, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, my name is Bill Fries. I'm with the Center for Food Safety, <clears throat> and um, we're a civil society group founded in '97. And we have kind of two missions: we support organic and other forms of sustainable agriculture, and then we also critically assess newer ag technologies like like GMOs, food irradiation, uh, cloning, and, some, and similar uh, technologies. Um, and we engage in public education um, and uh, work with regulators and when necessary we file lawsuits. We have lawyers and staff as well when, when we're not listened to, which is all too often. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the meaning of food labeling. Um, and you know, the topic of the day is genetically engineered foods and is Folks might have heard there are initiatives underway in a number of states to get mandatory labeling. Polls consistently show over 90% of U.S. citizens want mandatory labeling of GMOs. And the leading reason when people are asked is the right to know. You know, so even people who aren't convinced that GMOs are going to harm them or are necessarily uh, the devil's work just want to know. And they're suspicious when they're denied the right to know. Um, so, <clears throat> I don't know, if you go back far enough, the whole idea of food labels, I think, would be almost ridiculous because, you know, a century ago, most Americans were farmers and they, they were producing the food they consumed, so labels weren't really needed then. And I would say even up to World War II or so, most Americans either lived in rural areas or had rural backgrounds and so they were familiar with farming practices and, again, you know, you don't see much need for labels when you're not that distant from where your food is produced and how it's produced. And of course, now things have changed. I think the demand for labels has increased with, you know, the distance between producers and eaters. And also, of course, distrust with industrial farming practices, uh, you know, especially since World War II. So I just want to talk a little bit about organic as, I think, kind of the premier label. It's you know, had an enormous influence, I think, in, you know, changing, um, you know, at least a, a section of the, the, you know, way of how food is grown and, and produced. So I think a lot of people, when they think of organic, it's a choice against something, against pesticide residues originally, of course, in the 70s, and now maybe against GMOs. But I want to emphasize here in my talk a little bit what uh, the organic label, what choosing it is for, right? What, what is the positives that are being chosen when someone sees an organic label and buys organic food? And I think it's, it's complex. It's, it's not simply uh, wanting to protect one's health. It's wanting healthy food, farms, and communities. Um, has anyone heard of Sir Albert Howard? ring a bell to anyone. He's um, <clears throat> a plant, originally a plant pathologist. He, he worked in the first half of the 20th century. He's widely considered the godfather of organic agriculture. And this was at a time when Britain had its empire. So he was an agronomist who worked in developing countries. He very quickly became frustrated with specialist science that he had been trained in, that is to study fungal diseases of plants 
and he began to observe the practices that peasants were using you know, in India, the Caribbean countries where he worked. And he learned a lot from these folks and kind of also improved on these traditional practices and uh, came up with a whole philosophy about building healthy soils as the key to uh, you know, healthy agriculture. And <clears throat> essentially, it involved you know, building healthy soils, adding organic matter to soils, right? So compost, right? That's organic matter. You do that, and the soil suddenly becomes less prone to erosion, right? So it's, it's good, um, especially if you think back in the Dust Bowl days when erosion was a huge issue. Um, Sir Albert Howard also believed that you, you got healthier plants <coughs> through um, composting and through these uh, kind of organic methods and had numerous experiences to, to back this up in, in developing countries. Um, and healthier people because the food is often more nutritious. So basically, the, in the beginnings of organic, it wasn't about refuge a refuge from pesticide residues, it was considered the best way to farm. Um, here are a couple of studies that have been done recently. There are quite a few which demonstrate that organic vegetables, for instance, are more nutritious. And uh, it's, you know, more vitamin C and carotenoids, uh, some of those are precursors to vitamin A, phenolic compounds, antioxidants, um, uh, tomatoes, strawberries, it's, it's quite interesting, and this study is interesting because it connected the higher quality of the organic strawberry with the healthier soil that it was grown in. Um, I think another reason people choose organic is um, this concept of environmental health. And, you know, it's basically the insight that what harms critters is probably not good for us either. And I think we have to credit Rachel Carson this insight. And of course, everyone knows about Silent Spring, I'm sure. Hopefully. <laughs> um, and of course, her study looked mostly at, at the animal world and how it was being so terribly impacted by the pesticides of the day, including DDT. And, you know, birds are the image that come to mind, uh, poison birds. But there was also a, a human cancer epidemic that was in the United States that was just getting going at that time in the early 60s. And, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that it had a lot to do with all the industrial chemicals that were coming on into the environment after World War II, and that includes pesticides. One of the legacies of Rachel Carson is she inspired, I think, a whole generation of epidemiologists to look at, you know, how pesticides can be related to increased disease, and for instance, in farmers. Unfortunately, our EPA doesn't pay much attention to these studies. Um, and then, just briefly, uh, a woman, has anyone heard of Theo Colborn? No? She's kind of carried on Rachel Carson's work looking at endocrine disruptors. And this is chemicals in the environment that cause diseases other than cancer. Diseases that originate through some sort of disruption of our hormonal messaging system. Uh, and they're basically chemicals that look like hormones and that fool the body into thinking their hormones and so disrupting our development. Um, so environmental health, healthy agriculture, environmental health, also, also you know, at the farm level, healthy organic farms. I think it's interesting to look at when you choose to buy organic, what does that kind of mean in, in terms of on the farm practices and of course, the, the lack of pesticides and fertilizers, that's, that, that improves human and environmental health. But also, it's, it's very interesting, if you're not using these chemicals, you have to be more creative, right? You have to find other ways to, you know, fertilize your crops and to manage pests. You don't have those chemicals. So, uh, one of the biggest tools is crop diversity. Organic farmers will grow a lot of different crops in space and also in time that is crop rotations. And one good example is alfalfa, right? Alfalfa is a very good um, crop for improving the fertility of the soil. It fixes nitrogen. So if you include that in your crop rotation, you've eliminated the need, basically.
basically for inorganic nitrogen fertilizer. And it also turns out that it suppresses weeds in the crops that follow it. So it's, it's very you know, interesting how uh, <clears throat> choosing organic can mean you know, really a healthier, healthier farm. And of course, input costs are also reduced. Uh, farmers don't spend as much to farm. And then just, I guess just briefly, I think organic farming is just a lot more interesting than kind of the cookie cutter methods that industrial farmers use. And I sometimes wonder to what extent the flight from the farm that we're continuing to see, right? We're continuing to lose farmers. How much of it is, you know, young, you know, prospective farmers saying, this is, this is nonsense, this isn't interesting, you know, I've got more challenging things I want to do in the city. Um, you know, another, of course, another uh, aspect of the industrial farming is that it <clears throat> basically, you uh, inputs like pesticides also lead to reduction in labor needs. So that's one way you get increasing scale, right, is through uh, inputs like, like pesticides. With organic, on the other hand, you do need more labor to, to farm in a healthy way. And that puts a natural constraint on farm size. And that, in turn, creates jobs. And that means healthier rural communities. So I see the organic label uh, has been a tool for change in many different positive ways. Um, now I want to talk a little about GMOs, because that's kind of what I've worked most on. And <clears throat> I guess I'll start off by saying a lot of what you read about GMOs in the mainstream press is, is really not true. It's, or it's basically about little early stage experiments that never seem to bear fruit, that never come to fruition. So <clears throat> we have all of these claims for vitamin enhancement or higher yield salt tolerance. In fact, that's not what's, what's happened. That's not the crops that have actually been, the genome crops have actually been introduced. So, <clears throat> uh, and actually, you, you mentioned drought resistance. There's actually only one corn that genetically engineered for drought tolerance. And the USDA even says that it's, no, it's not any bit superior to conventionally bred drought resistant corn. So, so what are GMOs? Well, just a few basic facts. Almost the great majority of GMOs are grown in either North America or South America. And in South America, <clears throat> it's huge plantation agriculture, mostly soybeans. Soybean barrens, they're often called. And you, even, you have farms down there that are even bigger than in the United States. So this whole idea of feeding the world through helping small farmers is fiction. Right? GMOs are mostly big farmer agriculture. And then we hear about all of these crops. I was talking to the cab driver um, on my way here, and he was convinced that all of the vegetables he was growing in his garden were genetically engineered. And I said, no, no, that's not the case. Um, that, you know, but this is what the kind of stuff you read in the press. It's actually pretty much just four crops make up almost the whole universe of GMOs. And soybeans and corn in particular. Soybeans and corn, what are they used for? Feed. Feed, feed or? Not really, not much food at all. Biofuels, right? Ethanol, is what she said. Yeah. So it's not, you're not feeding the world with soybeans and corn. You're feeding animals and cars and rich nations. That's basically what we got here. Um, and then, which traits do we have? Again, it's basically uh, essentially just two traits, two types of GMOs that are out there. They're either resistant to herbicides or they're resistant to certain insect pests, or they have both traits. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about how the GMO model intensifies industrial agriculture, some of the trends I was talking about before in the section of organic. And I want to focus on these herbicide-resistant crops, which make up, as you see, 85% the red and the orange. If you take all the world's GM crops, right, by acreage, 85% of them are herbicide-resistant. They're hugely dominant. That's mostly what GMOs are all about. 
And <clears throat> almost all of these herbicide resistant crops are Monsanto's Roundup Ready. They're corn, soybeans, cotton that have been made resistant to the herbicide Roundup, right? Roundup will kill the conventional crop. Now these Roundup Ready crops are resistant to Roundup, so it can be sprayed much more freely. Um, and these are some of the impacts I'm going to talk about through, uh, of this Roundup Ready crop culture. First of all, this chart <clears throat> shows basically the percent of uh, various crops that are herbicide resistant. HT is, they say, herbicide tolerant. So basically 93% of the soybeans in the United States are herbicide resistant, 85% of the corn. It's hugely dominant. That's monoculture in a big way. Um, so yeah. These crops allow unrestrained use of the herbicides. And one impact is kind of interesting. It's, it's led to um, increased scale of farming because it turns out to spray Roundup in this way to kill weeds takes less labor than to kill weeds in other ways. And in South America in particular, this has really helped the soybean plantations expand and in many cases push the small farmers off the land. And we're definitely seeing this like in Argentina, for instance. And can anyone translate this, this title here? Agricultures without, you know, farmers. Farming without farmers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, a, this is a phrase that's kind of current in South America, when well, people think Roundup Ready, farming without farmers. Um, this, this quote here, this little factoid is from a high-level person in the Argentine Ministry of Agriculture one new job for every 1,250 acres of land converted to Roundup Ready soybeans. That same amount of land could support, you know, four to five, you know, family farms. Um, one of the impacts of Roundup Ready crops is a major increase in pesticide use. Um, 500, it's estimated that they've increased herbicide use by 527 million pounds in 16 years. Um, yeah, big time. And there's an epidemic of weeds that have become resistant to Roundup, and the chemical name of Roundup is glyphosate. So we have 24 weed species, 50 to 60 million acres these weeds are found. That's a huge, huge area. And this is all since the year 2000, and it's almost all attributable to these Roundup Ready crops and the constant, continual use of this one herbicide all the time. So, just for fun, can anyone tell me the crop that's growing here? Have any agronomy? It's not a very good picture. Is this the crop? No, I don't think so. I think the crop is down here. These are soybeans. Roundup Ready soybeans that have been sprayed with Roundup. Only this is called um, horseweed. It, and this is one of those glyphosate resistant weeds which has become incredibly widespread across the country. Not controlled anymore by Roundup. Again, this is, any guesses? Cotton. And this is glyphosate resistant pigweed. And half a million acres of cotton in 2009 just in Georgia were hand weeded because of this weed. That's how tough it is to control. And this is another Glyphosate was just a weed in Argentina that's really bad, called Johnson grass. Another aspect of GMOs is what you know sociologists often call de-skilling, right? I mean, farmers who have grown up, right, and they say their 20s or 30s, they've grown up with the Roundup Ready crops. They have no clue how to deal with weeds except spray Roundup. And this quote really struck me because it's from a weed scientist, right? Someone who's involved in this very area. He's, he admits it, you know. The young guys just don't know, you know, how to farm any other way now. And so what happens when you have de-skilled farmers is industry steps in with another, you know, so-called solution, right? Roundup Ready crops were a solution to previous weed problems, and now we're getting a whole host of new herbicide-resistant crops, right, designed to kill these Roundup-resistant superweeds. And this is Dow. Dow is developing one of them. And this is uh, a Dow officer kind of crowing at the opportunity this will provide his company to sell more pesticides and seeds. 
And these are just two of like, I don't know, about eight or 10 of such crops that are uh, soon to be introduced, perhaps in the next couple of years. And Dow has corn and soybeans resistant to 2,4-D, which is part of Agent Orange. Nasty stuff. We should not be using more of it. And yet, this is what's predicted to happen when these crops, if they're introduced, when they come online. Monsanto has uh, soybeans and corn all resistant to a similar herbicide. And an agronomist has predicted a huge increase in overall herbicide use if these crops become you know, widely used. I'm going to skip this. Um, I just want to talk about just a little bit about consolidation in the industry. Of course, we used to have a seed industry and a pesticide industry, but now they're one. And they're called the biotechnology industry. So it's important to keep that in mind. All of the, the biggest agrochemical companies, they bought up seed firms, and now they're also the biggest seed firms. These four companies control about half of the world's commercial seed now. It's actually a little more than this. Uh, this is 2007 uh, figure now. So um, huge control and power when you, you know, control such important um, inputs. And then this shows the increasing cost of seed. These companies have ramped up the prices of GM seed incredibly. And <clears throat> the other aspect of this is um, patents on seeds and lawsuits against farmers who, you know, formerly saved seed. Is, is that, are people familiar with this? The whole, yeah. Okay, so I won't go into it except Monsanto's really led the way, and especially with soybeans. Used to be about, in the 1980s, half of our soybeans were from saved seed, and now it's just a few percent thanks to patents. Um, I guess just a few comments on animals since I'm you know, supposed to be talking about that, but it's not really my specialty. Uh, but I don't know, it, I was just thinking, you know, CAFOs, I think it's important to keep in mind they're built upon the division of mixed farms, right, into specialized crop and then specialized livestock production, right? I mean, it's not that long ago when most farms had both the crops and animals. And, you know, so basically, you know, the, I think the CAFOs, when you're just focusing on animals, it lifts all constraints in size. You know, no mixed farmer has three or 4,000 pigs, right? You, you have crops to deal with. You can't, you know, you don't have time. Um, so there, there's something about this vastly increased scale, I think, that leads to a lot of the animal welfare concerns, a lot of the mistreatment of animals. Just to imagine your whole life dealing with nothing but you know, like three or four thousand hogs every day and all the manure they create doesn't breed like real friendly humane feelings, I think. Um, and then just a few closing slides on animals, the uh, GM salmon, have people have heard about that? Salmon that are engineered with the growth hormone gene so that they grow like several times faster than normal salmon. They haven't been introduced yet, we're fighting it, FDA is still assessing them. Um, <clears throat> some of the problems are the risk of escape and mating with wild salmon, um, high rates of deformity. Um, the company did not report this very well, and possibly increased susceptibility to disease, which is really, really concerning. Um, perhaps we should be eating lower on the, on the fish chain. And then finally, farming is. Um, a method of genetically engineering animals to be a bio, to be biofactory for certain pharmaceutical substances, and this, you know, a lot of work has been done trying to make more milk with more human-like proteins. There's some real safety concerns with that. FDA's not regulating this well, and then of course there's a the potential to discourage breastfeeding, as we've seen in the past through pushing of infant formula. Um, GM, GMO labeling, to come back to that, Washington State has an initiative that will be voted on next week. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, it looks pretty good. I think we'll probably get it. A number of other states have come close. Um, it's interesting with GMO labeling. It's maybe the first food label designed 
uh, to label a food that people don't want, right, versus organic, which is one you do want. But as I've tried to argue that, you know, it also does enable a choice for healthy foods in agriculture, such as organic. Thanks for your patience. Occasionally stutter when I speak. It's not a problem for me. It shouldn't be for any of you. If there's anything that I say that isn't 100% clear, please let me know. I'll go right back over it. So that being said, uh, I'm the lawyer in the room, I guess, uh, practicing lawyer, and I think that what I'm talking about this afternoon largely picks up where Nicole and Bill. Uh, went up to, and I really get involved when things go wrong. Uh, I represent lots of consumers and farmers across the United States. I've been litigating a lot of the leading biotech cases in the United States for about the past 13 or 14 years. Uh, I, which is sort of funny because number one, I was raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, number two, uh, I began my practice as securities lawyer. But anyway, things change. So one of the things that we've been doing, and Bill and I, the first time we met was on the Starling corn case, which we'll get to later on in this presentation. But let me get started for where we are. Uh, I think the key thing is, and we approach these cases, and we have these cases all over the country, that we approach these cases as really an effective tool for protecting rights, both on the consumer end and on the farmer end. Frankly, all the farmers I've represented over the years all plant GMO crops. That's not the issue for them. The issue for them and the issue for the majority of the cases we're involved in on that front is the responsible handling of those crops. And, and in, in terms of that, I think that's really the key point. The fact is, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you all think of it. GMOs are here. There isn't anything we're going to do about them. We hope that years down the road, we all don't wind up with all sorts of strange symptoms that a lot of people are seeing now. And frankly, we're looking into them. I know you're looking into them. Uh, it's something that is an active and ongoing situation. Uh, but the issue for us in the majority of our farming cases, our biotech cases, is whether things are handled responsibly because even though GMOs are largely accepted in the United States, as a lot of you know, our European and Asian trade partners really don't want them. And what happens a lot of the time is if in fact, even if you grow something in the United States, if a contamination incident occurs, as happened, for example, with the starling corn situation, the genetically modified rice situation, more recently, the Monsanto genetically modified wheat situation, you wind up with a very real problem because our foreign export partners will literally will turn the boats around, send them back, and cost U.S. farmers a lot of money. So, but we'll get up to that because as I see, as I'm going through 
my slides, it's not in the order that I'm talking, so I, I apologize for that. It's funny, before I came here this morning, uh, this afternoon, I was telling my wife, I figured I'm speaking at a school, I'm sure you all have this dream, which I never changes, that you, you find out that you have this final in a class that you haven't attended all year. <laughs> kind of had that, hate to tell you, I'm 20 years into this, it never changes. Uh, it just doesn't. Uh, but anyway, hopefully uh, I will pass. Uh, but anyway, so as, as Bill was talking about earlier with the pending proposition in Washington with the failed Prop 37 in California, one of the things we've been seeing is that the majority of the defendants we go up against every day are taking very active positions against GMO labeling. As I'm sure you all know, in the days leading up to the Prop 37 vote last year, these companies were spending over $1 million a day in the last 30 days or thereabouts to get the word out. They unfortunately overturned what seemed to be a very promising start in the Prop 37 issue. Hopefully there'll be a different effect in Washington, but I think the numbers in the past couple of weeks have begun shifting as well. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, what I've heard is that it, there's been about an 18% shift in, in the past couple of weeks. Yeah, I haven't kept real close tabs on it, but I think it, we're, we're doing better than, than we were in California. So. Right. So, Gotta hope for the best. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, Going back to the Starling situation, which I think for a lot of a lot of people in the biotech farming litigation field is really one of the first real crises uh, with what happened there. In the fall of 2000, uh, Friends of the Earth uh, were able to test and confirm that they found Starling corn, which was a a genetically modified corn seed in taco shells, I think it was, right? Tortillas. Right. And what happened was, there. this was a genetically modified corn seed, a crinine seed corn, that was genetically modified to resist certain kinds of bugs. Rootworm, I think it was, in European corn borer, if I recall it correctly. It's been a long time. And what happened as a result of that, while the people at Aventus Crop Science who own, who, who own the trade, they were able to get a limited registration uh, to produce it and keep it segregated for purposes of animal feed and industrial use only. Unfortunately, that really didn't work. And it got into the US, the US food corn supply contaminating it, and as a result of that, U.S. corn exports were shut down for a while. We got involved representing corn farmers across the corn belt in the United States. I think we represented farmers in 13 or 14 states. And we sought certification of a class of all the farmers who, who sustained economic losses as a result of the contamination and the reduction in U.S. exports, and the way that we treated it, I don't know how many of you are in securities, law classes now here at DePaul or elsewhere, the way that we treated it was we treated the corn market or the corn futures market as an efficient market, the way that we do in securities cases, and we argued that the negative news as a result of uh, the contamination event went into the pricing of the corn futures market, resulting in a drop in corn futures prices, there, thereby leading to a drop in the price that corn farmers got for their crop at the elevator. So through that, we were able to, to, to get a pretty strong settlement for the farmers. And at the same time, uh, the Aventus people, at the very beginning of the case, launched a very aggressive buyback program to get as, as much of it at head of the system as possible. The problem is, as we know from the GM alfalfa situation, once it's out there, it's out there. And it's, it's very hard to unring that bell. Now, while our case was pending, 
Leventis Crop Science was sold to the German company Bayer. And several years later, in August of 06, Bayer Crop Science, it turned out, contaminated the U.S. rice supply. You know, there it goes again. And what happened at that point, they discovered a contaminated rice shipment overseas. And this was actually, even though the rice crop in the United States is far, far smaller than the corn crop is, the effect of what happened here and the market effect was really strong. It led to a severe drop in rice prices across the United States in the five states where long grain rice is grown. And resulted, what happened there was actually, actually interesting. And I don't know how, how many of you in the law school are taking any sort of class action litigation classes or anything like that or understanding the, the shifting standards for, for class certification that have happened, that has happened in the past 13, 14 years. But since the time of the Starling case, back in the early part of last decade, the class, the class certification standards have shifted. So frankly, in the Rice litigation, we lost class, class cert on predominance grounds. But what happened was the losses were so incredibly large that we began to take these cases forward as individual cases. We ended up going through three five-week long full-blown jury trials in federal court in Missouri. We got verdicts in our favor in all three of them. The fourth of our trials settled after the fourth day of the trial in October of 2010. And that then led to a settlement which resulted in the U.S. rice farmers getting between three and four hundred dollars per acre for each of their acres. If the average rice farm is 400 acres, you're talking about farmers getting somewhere in the range of $150,000, $160,000 each for the market losses arising out of this situation. Now, shifting a little bit from uh, the farmer cases to the consumer cases and picking up on the points that were made earlier, uh, I'm sure you've all seen in the paper there's all sorts of all natural litigation going on. Frankly, we filed one case along those lines. This is the only one we filed because against ConAgra for the false labeling we allege of Western oil. And this is just one of the examples of where when labeling rules are not followed properly, again, we step in where things go wrong. Our view is that by labeling Western oil 100% natural, when frankly it contains 100% genetically modified crops, uh, they're defrauding the U.S. public. And we've overcome the motion to dismiss in that case. We're fighting very hard in discovery right now. Obviously, ConAgra doesn't want to give us anything. They certainly don't want to give us all the information from the anti-Prop 37 fight. And we've tried getting that. That hasn't been a fun conversation. <laughs> uh, but we're going on there. And what, what's interesting about it is with Wesson Oil, uh, the, fact that, the fact is, as all of you have seen the ads over the years, they've called themselves 100% natural for years and years and years. One would think there is one memo, maybe two, somewhere in the file in Nebraska from about 95 or thereabouts when the first commercial GM crop came in with the people at ConAgra saying, is, is this going to be a problem? That's the memo I want. I haven't seen it yet. But we're still working on it. Uh, likewise, the only, uh, and this goes to the labeling issue as well, and what labels really mean, and all of the labels that you put up, Nicole, in terms of the varying standards. I think one of them that is particularly misleading is the American Heart Association Heart, Heart Check Certified Label which we, we recently sued the American Heart Association and Campbell's because what happens is, what frankly I didn't know until my client contacted me, is that while the American Heart Association sells, sells its logo or its heart check certified seal to all these companies, the impression that I think people get frankly that I got was that when you see that it means that the food that it's on uh, it satisfies the AHA's standards for, for example, 
low sodium. However, that's, that's not the case. The truth is, all that means is that it satisfies the FDA minimum. So the fact is that um, they're lying to millions of consumers by selling this product with an improper label on it. So in terms of other, and there's a severe typo here, I apologize for the, the failure to proofread this. I feel terrible about that because I'm, I'm usually the guy who gets really angry at people about that. But uh, we recently resolved this case. This is another case, well this doesn't involve a food issue, it involves actually a uh, plant herbicide issue. And what happened here, Imprella's herbicide was launched by DuPont back in 2012, or, or no, 2011, excuse me, as a turf herbicide. And the problem was, as soon as they began selling it to the commercial applicators, the lawn care operators, the professionals, and who began spraying it on turf, it, it began killing everyone's trees. And it killed millions of trees around the United States. It actually, it contains some of the same chemical that was in Agent Orange as well. It was a powerful, powerful chemical. Four ounces, essentially, could do multiple acres. Uh, so, well, what happened here, this is just one more example of one of the large biotech companies acting, acting improperly and resulting in severe damages to the American public. And the way that we've been litigating these cases, in this case, Starling, the Rice litigation, uh, the people who are litigating the wheat litigation now, they're largely focusing on breach of duty claims and public nuisance claims and private nuisance claims, showing how the people who were involved, the affected parties, were hurt by the use of, of these chemicals. We represented many, many homeowners across the United States, in the Imprellis case, homeowners, country clubs, golf course, golf course owners, who, who lost these 100 foot tall, 100 year old trees because of, because of DuPont's interest in its bottom line over everything else. It was a, a poor, poorly tested product, a poorly researched product. I deposed the head of science at DuPont on this, and at the end of the day, they really didn't know the far-reaching effects it would have. And for that reason, they had agreed to an EPA, re uh, an EPA recall, which resulted in a relatively quick resolution, and they've been replacing trees by the hundreds of thousands around the United States at this point. So, <coughs> going back, just in closing, because I know we're short on time, going back to one, <coughs> to one of the other points, to one of our most common targets, the Monsanto people, to tell one quick story about how far they will go to protect their technology. Back in 2004, we filed an antitrust case against Monsanto, Pioneer, and DuPont, alleging price fixing in Roundup Ready and Yield Guards corn and soybean seeds. About a month or two after we filed our case, all of my clients got sued by Monsanto. They claimed patent infringement. And why did they, did they claim that? I don't know if any of you have seen a Monsanto license agreement. Every farmer who wants to buy a Monsanto seed needs to sign a license agreement that says all sorts of things. But one of the things that it has is a forum selection clause in the contract that says, if you sue us, you have to sue us in state or, or federal court in St. Louis, Missouri. We sued in everyone's, their home courts, on the view that this sort of claim, a federal antitrust claim, which sounds in criminal law in the first instance, was outside of the forum selection clause. As most of you will see if you're going to be in litigation, the right response to that, or the normal response to that, is to, to move to dismiss on forum selection grounds. Well, they didn't do that. What they did was, with this patent infringement claim, they said, by not suing us in St. Louis, you committed a, a breach of contract. As a result of that, the patent license in each contract was auto, auto, 
automatically terminated. Every one of you farmers is now planting our seeds without a valid license agreement, thereby committing patent infringement. I'm not really sure what to say anymore on that. It was just we were stunned when <laughs> we got the complaint. We were stunned when we fought again. We ultimately won that fight. But it's very hard to call up your clients and say, no, <laughs> your life's not at risk here. I promise you, we will get you out of this. But that's how far they will go to chill any sort of debate. And at, at around that time, the Center for Food Safety put out an excellent book, I don't know if you've all seen, on, I believe it was called Monsanto against the U.S. farmers? Monsanto versus U.S. Yeah, right. Which simply lists example after example after example of Monsanto acting extraordinarily aggressively to protect its own interests, but frankly, at the expense of the American farmers and, on a broader sense, the American public. So that's all I got. If anyone has, has any questions, I think it's now time to. Yeah, let's open it question up for questions. Yeah, I was just kind of quick. Does Ma I read a case a couple of years back. Um, uh, does Monsanto still have uh, the uh, provision on the contract cost? Not only that you can only sue them in Missouri, but if they go after you for patent infringement, you have to defend in St. Louis, even if you've never been to the state of Missouri. It's funny, they funny used to that you asked that, and, uh, because uh, one, of, one of the arguments we made was we searched around for all of the collection cases Monsanto filed, and they didn't, they didn't file them in Missouri. Monsanto's argument was, you know, we can sue you anywhere we want. Uh, the fact that we choose to sue you elsewhere doesn't mean that you can sue us elsewhere, but in terms of the exact clause you're talking about that you need to defend in Missouri, I believe that was the case several years ago. I'm not yeah. sure it's the case now. Okay. Um, so. I mean, there's an actual case. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anything's changed since then. And, and trust me, su suing Monsanto in its own backyard is not fun. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I sure they six, select the I spent six years doing that. Of their it was, choice for not reason. fun to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the situation with, uh, I don't know to, who can answer it, but uh, as far as labeling pet food, I mean, I would like to buy my cat GMO free food, uh, but it's not labeled. I, I mean, I've asked my different pet stores and they, they really. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would think that labeling initiatives, if they go through, I would think they would include pet foods as well. But yeah, at, at present, of course, we have no mandatory labeling of any foods, human or, or pet. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, of course, I, I don't know, are there some pet foods that, that label non-GM, or is that? There are dog foods, but not cat foods. No, no. Okay. Yeah. 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 If we have GMO labeling, do you think consumers will understand what that means? I mean, will that convey meaningful information to them? That's an interesting question. I mean, definitely in Europe, I think it, it's it's pretty clear that you know consumers have used the, the GM label to choose against these foods because you don't really see many of them at all in, in European supermarkets. Of course, there's an overall higher level of awareness, and we've you know had GMOs now for 15 or 20 years. But I don't know. Just again, the polling data shows high levels of concern, um, and you know just the the energy behind the various state initiatives. It's in, you know, I think at least two dozen states had efforts to have. 26 you know, states. It's 26, yeah, thank you. And, you know, not all of them have you know, succeeded, obviously. That, that, to me, that shows a high level of interest and concern and, you know, growing awareness. So yeah, I think people will kind of at least get the idea that we don't, you know, we don't want GMOs. Um, or think about the other side of the point. Keep party freaks going out and buying it on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if we have. If they tea party freaks in the audience, I apologize. <laughs> if there's GMO labeling, do you think then the originators of GMO foods will say, well, well, we'll tell you that it's safe? I mean, it's, it's just a, a way of making food better or 
Well, that, you may, you're not well, having information. Say, you know, that, that's what they've been saying yeah. now for, for you know, 15 years. And in part, they've tried to use that as an argument against labeling, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. if, if a food's not safe, you don't label it. You, you don't put it on the market in the first right, place. Right. I didn't get to that in my talk, but there, there is evidence of you know, at least potential health harms in the GMOs. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it would be, I think they might redouble their efforts with labeling. Um, I, I'm not sure that it's going to help just mm -hmm. because there is tremendous and growing skepticism. What does the science show about the safety of GMOs? You know, my, I think my chief concern these days. I, as Adam said, I was around during Starlink, and I, I'm not sure if Adam mentioned it, but the reason it was never approved for human food use, the reason it was only approved for animal feed use, is because scientists said this could cause allergies in people because of the type of insecticide that it contained. Okay. Um, so it, there were legitimate health concerns with Starlink. And it's actually those the same concerns apply to other similar types of gym corn that have similar insecticides. EPA has just kind of ignored those issues. Um, my biggest concern, frankly, these days is all of these herbicide-resistant crops, resistant to 2,4-D, dicamba. There's one just approved uh, bear crop science resistant to an herbicide called isoxaflutol. EPA even says, all right, it's a probable human carcinogen. And you know, if this is adopted and used, there's going to be a lot more of this stuff sprayed. So, it's, it's interesting, it's more the pesticides, herbicides with these herbicide-resistant crops. That's my top level concern. Um, for other issues with genetic manipulation itself, we, we definitely need a stronger you know, regulatory system um, and labeling in the meantime. <laughs> I, I had two questions. First, if, if um, it seems like most of the GM food then is headed towards animal feed, and so then have animals started to show signs. I mean, I feel like I've read that mm -hmm. there have been issues with sterility in animals that have been on this diet for so long, and whether there's been any research on the impact for animals being on this GM diet. But then also, um, you know, in these places where there are Driscoll's, I think, up with organic berries with the regular berries when you're talking about, and I can see this with farmers who are trying to do, I, it seems like there's some brands that try to do both organic and not, how they can balance those with all the, the issues that you're talking about and exposing their organic to crops that was in the wind blows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cross yeah, interesting question. So, I mean, on, I would say on, on the, uh, the animal feed issues. There's there's definitely been reports out there. I actually know of a farmer in Iowa who had huge problems with his hogs. He, he's no longer a hog farmer now because his pigs got um, what a, a condition called pseudo pregnancy. Very yeah, Jerry was Jerry was in, and it was weird. They would swell up as if they were pregnant, but then there would be no fetus there, and it was um, it's a condition that's associated with a certain uh, fungal toxin, but the, those, the fungus was not in his corn, so he, it was GMO corn. So there was there were scientific investigations into it, and uh, it, it, it's it's possible that this corn had increased levels of, of toxins that were causing this problem. Trouble is, they were also found to some extent in conventional corn, so the case wasn't completely clear scientifically. Um, so. Sorry, not, not <laughs> but and then on the organic, I as you probably saw, I carefully kind of ignored the whole question of industrial organic, um, and it is an issue. You know, unfortunately, there are big players in there who are doing it more for kind of the profit potential. They see, well, we can, you know, make make it, make the premium, but and they're not in it for you know to promote healthy farming. So maybe they'll do a little of both, whatever's convenient. Um, yeah, I mean, you'd have to know the layout of the farm to know about pesticide drift, but that could definitely be an issue, I think. One of our roles, we are on the board that kind of helps set organic standards, and there's definitely pressure from the big players to weaken the standards, lower them, so that it's easier to be organic, right? Um, so that you can, the least possible expense, label organic and get that for you. So, so there is that element, and we just have to keep fighting that. That's 
I may just have missed this. You said that there were four main GMO crops, um, corn, soybeans, cotton, and what was the fourth one? Canola. Canola, oh. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of cotton, I didn't know there was so much GMO cotton. If you buy cotton items that, that aren't organic, then you're probably wearing or using GMO cotton. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 probably over ninety five. It, it's in the U.S. It's about ninety nine percent actually. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, just quick. So, it, let's say you are concerned about uh, GMO cotton, uh, but every other, pretty much any garment you buy, mainstream garment is going to be GMO cotton. If you're buying a cotton garment. Yeah, it, and the cotton is from the United States. I mean, I, I don't know the cotton markets well enough to know. Maybe yeah, like you know, how much. Asking if there's like other countries that don't use that use pure, you know, non-modified cotton. Well, you know, it's interesting because there's um, Uganda has uh, a pretty vibrant organic cotton industry, and for a while, maybe still, Walmart of all people was carrying an organic cotton line of maybe baby clothing, I think, and it was a big hit. I mean, I hate to give credit to Walmart for anything, but apparently, you know, they're so huge that it really did mean a significant increase in demand for organic cotton. Um, unfortunately, it's, cotton is really hard to grow organically. Um, you know, it does take a lot of skill and work, and it's just, it's not done very much here. I just Probably thought of it when somebody mentioned it. Uh, but uh, actually, one more quick one, if you have a second. Uh, hasn't GMO corn been going on for a really long time? Since 95. Oh, since this? Yeah. yeah. The first commercial crop was 66, yeah. yeah. first commercial crop started in the mid-90s. Okay. You might be thinking of hybrid Maybe that's corn. It. Yeah, that, that was the first and most intensively hybridized crop, and that got started in the 20s and 30s. One of the reasons for the confusion is hybrids they don't breed true, so that if you're a farmer and you, you're growing, almost all farmers grow hybrid corn these days. It can be conventional hybrid or GM, GM hybrid. Uh, but whether it's, even if it's a conventional type hybrid, you can't save the seeds, because if you do and replant it, you'll get some off type, right? It, it doesn't have the yield, but you know, it can be weird in various ways. So hybrids were an early form of kind of preventing seed saving, you know what I mean? So. They have that in common with, with GMOs, and so I think that's why some people are confused. Well, thank you again to our speakers. And we'll take about a 10-minute break and then come back for our last panel.